sounds good. It takes a long time to drive anywhere in the Australian outback. This part of Australia has long been the domain of diesel-powered utes and petrol four-wheel drives. But as the electric vehicle revolution takes hold around the world, it's slowly making its way to the heart of the country. In the first week of owning this car, we went from Brisbane straight down the east coast right to the uh, most southern tip of Victoria and then came up through South Australia. So we did about 8,000 kilometres in the first week. Hunter Murray is the vice president of the Australian Electric Vehicle Association. His electronic shop sells solar panels and batteries made by Tesla and other companies. The self-described tech geek has installed the fastest EV charger in the Northern Territory on the side of his shop in Alice Springs. It's all powered by a solar array on his roof, backed up by batteries. Here it takes around two hours to charge for a 400 kilometre range. Hunter Murray uses his electric vehicle as part of his business, servicing remote electronic setups like mobile phone towers, often travelling hundreds of kilometres a day. But once he's out of town, the only place to charge is at remote locations like this, an hour's drive south of Alice Springs. We've proven that we can drive EVs around Australia and long distance, that's not a problem. It's just the time to make it to do that. We might need roughly double the time as, as normal because of the lack of charging. Once we get that charging infrastructure up, get it fast, um, there's no excuse. Yeah, we're just getting back to town today and we thought we'd uh, drop in and get a bit of a charge out of you. Hey, Peter stuff. Murphy, who's better known just as Spud, owns this roadhouse. Right, how's the jiggy going? Oh, not a problem, mate. After some encouragement from Hunter, he put in an EV charging station a few years ago. But it's slow. Yep. To charge 400 kilometres of driving range could take five hours. Why did you want to put one in? Because I think it's a way of the future. Down into the generator shed here, we're going to check uh, one motor before we start it. Like most remote service stations, Stewart's Well is a long way from any electricity grid and has to create its own power using diesel generators. We've got power. There's plenty of sunshine and he says he'd like to install solar panels and batteries. The advantage is moving with the future and cutting the diesel costs. Cutting, cutting down on diesel costs alone would be phenomenal. Mm. How much do you spend on diesel? Oh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. There's another bonus too. You've got the atmosphere. You haven't got diesel smoke going into the air. Fast chargers like those found in big cities can charge a car to travel 400 kilometres in just 20 minutes, depending on the make. But installing one could cost upwards of $150,000 and a new solar and battery system to power it could be half a million dollars. All right, bud. Catch you after. Take care. The more vehicles we have, though, the more warranty there's going to be for that. In Alice Springs, one big organisation is starting to transition its fleet to electric vehicles. The Central Land Council supports Indigenous people in the southern half of the Northern Territory. Its fleet of 120 vehicles covers an area larger than France. Only one car is electric. But we're also planning to have another two electric vehicles in the fleet within the next six months. The Land Council's EV fleet will be powered by a huge solar array on the roof of their headquarters. Francine McCarthy says although the electric vehicles cost more upfront than a comparable new petrol vehicle, that should be offset by charging the car for free. The infrastructure, the charging infrastructure, if that's placed in uh, locations that are outside of um, Alice Springs, 
um, then the Lake Council will be able to use these electric vehicles um, to go f further afield, say up to Tennant Creek or down to um, Eldunda and Uluru. Last year, the federal government granted $25 million to build fast charging infrastructure in regional Australia. But the funding is mostly going to the coastal fringe of the country. There's nothing for the outback. <coughs> Energy Minister Angus Taylor wasn't available for an interview, but in a statement said the government is addressing charging black spots with targeted co-investment with industry through the $250 million Future Fuels Fund and has committed to building 403 fast charging stations, including in the Northern Territory. For now, those pushing EVs for the outback will keep going, maybe just a little more slowly than they'd like. You know, we've got this huge nuclear generator that comes up in the morning and goes down at night, and uh, all we need to do is catch it, you know, um, and it's free. That's <laughs> a pretty good deal. There we go. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, I've got to admit, I stole that one off Elon. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll continue on. Um, so yeah, that was a fun day actually. We uh, were out pretty well filming for the whole day. It was actually, if you if you noticed, that the sharp people in the room might have noted the, noticed the poppy on my shirt, um, or that big fat fella shirt. I don't know who he was. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that was actually uh, basically September, uh, not September, um, November 11th um, thingy day. That's when we actually filmed it. But when it got aired was just uh, about two nights before the election got called. So it was, um, so it was pretty timely. Um, it's hot news. It's, it's something that we should all be flapping our gums about. And, um, and, and, and it's come up. Um, Labor has uh, announced that they want to cover certainly the Stuart Highway, um, the Nullarbor, and anything missed out in Western Australia. Um, anyway, so that's really what my talk about is tonight. Um, um, Steve there on the, uh, from ABC covered a little bit on the thing, but I'd like to, um, I'll share with the screen now, I'd like to um, just, just two things, go through roughly what, um, where we actually are at with, uh, uh, let's just go there. Okay, so you can all see that. Fast Charging Network's national plan and proposal. Can yep. you all see that? Yep. Yep, yep. fantastic. So um, so I really want to run through you with um, where we are at with the uh, with the charging network across Australia and, and focusing on SANT. And then also um, run through past you guys as my peers. Um, hopefully a really universal proposal to... Um, to get these things rolled out there really quickly and, and fairly efficiently um, and, and well maintained in the long term. Um, I, I feel that the, the current network is great where we've got, but um, it takes a lot of infrastructure to, to get a charge station going. And hopefully this might, um, if I can coin the word uh, nicely, short circuit the that, that, that plan at the moment. So I really want to thank, first of all, Charles, uh, Charles Gregory from Tassie, who helped me with this mapping content. In fact, he probably did most of this um, um, PowerPoint, but uh, it's a really great PowerPoint um, in the sense of where the charging infrastructure has come over the last sort of five years nationally. And we're mainly talking about fast charging here. We're not talking about too much about um, um, AC charging, although all, pretty well all we've got in the territory is AC charging, so I will touch on that too. So let's see if I can get the next page up. Maybe if I click on it and go like that. There we go. Um, so what's included in this update? So it's uh, all the sites have limited access. Um, sites which don't don't always support Chatmo and CCS2. Um, we have 25 kilowatt. Sorry, that's the siren on my end. <laughs> Alice Springs at night time. Gotta love it. Um, 25 kilowatt locations in regional areas, uh, we've included them and, and all the Tesla superchargers, we've included them as, as fast, DC fast chargers and above. Um, some of them, you know, as ultra fast chargers and etc. Um, so we're specifically, uh, and again, Charles wrote a bit of this, so okay, we're specifically looking at, um, the different networks that are progressing across the states. Um, and what what I'd love to see is is a common network. Really, the 
the fact that we have to change and flip and apps and stuff like that we don't have that much trouble up here at the moment because we don't have that as a choice but we understand that it's 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 a pain um tassie's got some really great ideas obviously using credit cards at every site but that can be a headache and a cost that's that's unnecessary too so um but anyway um so what do we already have we top end wise we've got um charge fox and ev networks are the two sort of kind of ultra rapid 350 kilowatt charging networks um they usually have two of each per site and uh, obviously starting to get established amongst the the major eastern state backbone um and and a little bit from victoria and new south wales on the south australian uh side so pretty cool um racwa uh oh look at that first in australia and of course that Queensland super electric super highway, we'll see a map of that shortly, um, done back in 2017. Um, interesting fun fact, that that highway was only about, they did 13 charge points, just anyone to correct me if I'm wrong, um, right from um, Brisbane to Cairns. And that only cost about three and a half to $4 million. And keep in mind, just one service station cost about two, two and a half million dollars. So they did 13 virtual stations for a really cheap price. So even, and that's hardwired and, and put in nicely. So just keep in mind how cheap these things can be compared to the alternative. And um, so NRMA charging, they really started from 2019 onwards. Uh, that was amongst in the, in the midst of New South Wales. Uh, Tazzy, uh, fantastic. Those guys have got a great network down there. Um, they have the, the the tyranny of distance on their side, which is good, uh, 2020 onwards, and, um, well, charging the regions. So, plus many other individual businesses, like my own, uh, councils and smaller operators have been um, at least trying to make a dent in the, in the um, I guess, the fleet of charges. So, this is a quick map of where we were in 2018. Um, these were mainly Tesla uh, 75 to, to 120 kilowatt chargers. Um, you see there, there's a bit of a code. So we had 50s and 25s. I didn't have mine that one at that stage. 2021, we saw the rollout of the NRMA, as we mentioned earlier, and um, certainly saw um, um, some great moves on on where they were going with New South Wales. Perth sort of definitely sprung up as well by the ten, end of 2021. But now, um, um, sorry, yep. So you can see there that um, that one up to Cairns. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's probably more, more like 20 or 15, no, 20, 20 sites, I think it was. Um, by this stage, um, yep, Darwin also had this little demo 25 kilowatt charger, I think, and I certainly had one there in the middle of Alice Springs. Um, so we'll get, we'll follow those through in a second and show you what they're all about. Um, so, uh, just a quick run about uh, what um, Stephen was talking about on the article. Arena um, certainly did did do on their first round, did a fair bit of this is 25 million odd for 100, 403 public fast charges. They mainly went to EV and, um, uh, and funnily enough, Ampole, the sign has been re-engineered re um, back from the depths. Um, I think they've taken over um, Castro, uh, sorry, is it Castro? Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Yep. Um, and Inji, I can never say that right. And Charge Fox, they all got a good um, taste of that. But but luckily, EHT um, Clive down there got some money out of that one too. Um, there's that super highway we we're talking about. Um, now they've they've extended their stage three um, to inland, right up to Mount Isa, uh, our border in Northern Territory. Oh, 300 k's off our border. Um, but you see that inland ne network is looking really, really good now. Um, that gives us a path to the eastern states from our part of the world. Um, again, they're, they're trying to make their coastal route less than 100 kilometres. I reckon that's a really good, per stop, sorry, I reckon that's a really good um, um, number to aim for. Um, it's certainly on average anyway. Um, but there is some large gaps inland, as he's mentioned there. Um, Victoria is going big gangs, um, so, so $5 million in grants to some 32 recipients, including a mixture of fast charges and destination charges, uh, predominantly local government organisations and notably um, EV networks, which received about two thirds of the funding, interestingly enough. 
So all fast charging sites are nominal 50 kilowatts and all um, mainly one stall, which we want to talk about a little bit further about redundancy. So um, in Charge Smart 2, so uh, this is great. This is um, the evolution of um, some AVA members, um, which we can go over um, $700,000 worth of grants um, to complement the 600,000 received from the first round in 2019. Um, mostly in intermittent locations, uh, intermediate locations compared to existing fast chargers. Many are 25 kilowatts. Um, can be a bit limiting, but it's great for the for the for the Leafs and the and the shorter range cars because that's a, a big jump in charging speed for them. Um, most have shorter range uh, over AC anyway. Most have shorter range, so it will not be necessary for long range EVs. So it's getting rid of that issue of having the more expensive EVs. We can make them more affordable for people who want to travel. Um, now, obviously, some may be faster than 100 kilowatts, and the largest gap there is uh, 150 kilometres to 85, but averaging less than 50 kilometres per gap. Um, there's some details there. If someone wants to look that up, that's fine. South Australia just announced, as you guys would have known. Sorry if I've gone dark here. My lights have just decided to turn off on me, but can you still hear me all right? Yeah. Yep, yep cool. Um, so South Australia, as you guys would all know, but the Northern Territory guys may not, who are listening, in, um, they are going big guns with a big announcement, but yep, still a lot to come. Um, there is some there, I think they're in yellow that have already been done. Uh, no, sorry, what's that? No. One? Marla, no, they're the ones that are gonna be very old by the time we get there. It's probably gonna be 2025 by the time um the Stuart highway is particularly done there which i'll touch on a little bit later um let's have a look so rea was the the successful operator to work along with charge fox again they have ties with nrma um, being their sister um, partners there so i'm sure they'll be involved as well um 536 cv charging points were elected and at 140 sites in 50 locations or sites in 50 approximately 50 locations uh, okay, uh, Western Australia too um, uh, recently announced um, some very uh, interesting rollout there, certainly to, to hit their coastline. Of course, they're the, the biggest state we've got, so they've got a lot of area to cover. Um, so let's have a look. So they'll be, yeah, they'll have the claim to the longest EV um, highway in the world pretty well. Um, they uh, will be fully funded and built by the state government at $21 million and appears to be predominantly 150 kilowatt sites um, in, in the on-grid areas and a mixture of 50, 75 and 150 kilowatt sites in the remote areas in the yellow. Um, missing links between Norseman and 720Ks to the South Australian border. And that's where our uh, friends um, have been doing the um, uh Hi. the yeah the, the the generator type solutions with um I'm, I'm, I'm sorry bear with me with there we go true um the generator solutions with the biofuels thank you okay there we go that's it so the biofuel one so they're basically using i think it's a, a um, 70 kva or 75 kva generator that's been converted to Taking um, taking in the local chip oil from the from the roadhouse that it's been localed at, and any and, if it, and basically because they they know they're not going to get a lot of um, traffic at this stage, but over time they can um, have the biofuel um, or biofuel used as a um, as I guess a, a circular type economy where um, you know we're, we're growing the fuel and therefore should be turning around in the big circular thing. Um, but again, these are temporary sites. We want we want um, we want the government to to fix these up, and I guess this is where I get the idea from from my idea, which I'm going to um, talk to you about very shortly. So, uh, just the system uh, for our oil drums generator and DC fast unit, 50 kilowatts, um, it's fully self-contained, costs just under 100,000, um, and it's way less than a solar battery system, which I would agree. Uh, has no impact on the roadhouses, electricity supply, totally totally independent. And the current EV traffic, as we mentioned, is probably only about <laughs> basically five cars a year. So the roadhouse is certainly going to produce enough waste to to do 50 cars a year. So that's um, for now, for the next few years, that's probably perfect. 
Um, but what it does give us too is actually data of actually how many people are using it, not just a guess. So to have that data, um, as, as the site gets busier and busier, we can then plan for a, 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 a a size up of a new new thing or somehow connect to the um to the local grid of the roadhouse uh, okay the unit has been located yep about 370 k's from the western australian sa networks so i think there's about three all up guys is that right at the moment mm. yeah sorry here we go an additional 25 kilowatt dc charge have been installed about 150 kil kilometers either side so this is a, a one-off this one New South Wales EV strategy, uh, they've been going for a little while too. Uh, it's the easiest place to buy an electric vehicle at the moment uh, with 131 million invested in development of world class charging network. Tenders have been requested uh, and the first change of approximately half of these sites standard for full stalls at 175 kilowatts. So they're definitely going big guns, got the best grid in Australia as well. So why not? Um, it makes it easy for them to install. Gold Coast uh, just initiated um, in this, uh, installing of fast chargers at 10 locations and uh, Act2 AGL partnering with EV to install fast chargers across the ACT. So let's have a quick evolution of the maps here. Again, um, this is where we're kind of at, at at the end of 2021, which is uh, awesome. You can see New South Wales and Victoria really blowing out. Um, the future fuel funds see some stuff up in Darwin and um, uh, down in Adelaide getting produced in the in this this coming year. Certainly Perth is going to go big guns as well. Oh. The Q, QES stage three, um, which is Queensland, you can see there that fills out that inland Queensland, which certainly gets them to catch up. Um, this is beyond now too, by the way, this is what's planned. Uh, DC AV Victoria absolutely uh, fills those holes there in, in rural Victoria, that's awesome. And Charge Mart in Tassie again is doing another round of their ones that we mentioned earlier. And the SA Electric Highway, well, that you know, shall we seeing there um, going up to um, the border towards us, um, picking up the border towards Perth, uh, sorry, towards uh, WA, and certainly some pretty good stuff around York Peninsula and, um, and the Flurio, and the bloody one on Kangaroo Island there. That's awesome. Um, WA electricity, so there you go, there's the big one we mentioned earlier that's going to go up to um, the border there for Northern Territory and the biofuel sites, which are those ones there, the three there, the 225s and the, and the 50, um, may get picked up very shortly by some promises from some certain um, um, polit political parties that uh, we're hopefully going to all sort out this Saturday. Uh, and the New South Wales government, sorry, uh, there you go. So they, they've got to infill a lot of stuff in there, um, as you can see there. So, um, so really what's happening with rural SANT and WA? Uh, there's a lot of holes to fill in WA. There's a, um, certainly um, the federal elections, the big current delay, um, certainly depending on which party gets in. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that too much, but um, you know, really, we're in a bit of a, a holding pattern until we see um, who's going to hand out the money and where, obviously. But uh, there's been promises for the Stuart and the Nullarbor having fast charging access, and they're going to go in conjunction with NRMA. But can we wait for this? Um, unfortunately, out of rural, it's a chicken and egg uh, scenario that's affecting all of our small population. Um, and um, so, of course, yeah, we're, we're kind of the poor cousins out here as usual. Um, we have some choices though, uh, we need to raise some funds, join forces, um, but there is just so much work to do. I just think people besides ourselves really don't understand the massive amount of work this stuff's going to cause, um, thousands and thousands of jobs. I can, I can only preach to the converted here and, and <laughs> hopefully you guys can spread the word. Um, so, um, I've just patched in what. PlugShare uh, tells us what's actually out there at the moment. Um, so these are all the 32 kilowatt, uh, sorry, 22 kilowatt, 32 amp sites that are that are currently running uh, in SA and NT. Um, and this is since 2017. Uh, Ava and Toker have lobbied together and built up this electric highway uh, AC network, and uh, we're using basically those standard uh, plugs. You'll see in a second. Um, we're working with most of the uh, the the owners of the townhouses and um, sorry most towns and roads uh, roadhouses along the way 
but the challenge definitely is the lack of grid out there. There's lots of island grids. Um, they're just not part of the national electricity market. And this, and thus the major dependence on, and, and a lot of them have got major dependence on diesel generation, even the larger island grids. Um, so we really need to get all the stakeholders involved and we really need to come up with a solution that no one really wants to pay for. <laughs> so, so let's see if we can do that. Um, and what it says for me is, uh, you know, what, 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 what the roadhouses are certainly going to say, and most of the people, well, what's in it for me? I've been selling fuel for the last hundred years. Um, what am I going to get out of it? Well, my proposition is to get cheap power um, from from a power purchase agreement and a, a percentage of, of the revenue of um, sales to electric vehicles. So on the South Australian side, you can see there that um, the RAA, well, we mentioned before, the RAA is going to have a a rollout, but we really won't be seeing that till the end of 2025. Um, and if then, uh, knowing our um, um, government rollouts, they tend to stretch out a little bit. Um, seems to be aimed at this time to the end users. Oh, sorry, um, NT government uh, has announced their EV goals uh, almost 12 months ago. Um, there was a little bit of a hint in their um, uh, announcement a few days ago that seems to be basically aiming on end users with a drop in stamp duty of, to, of $1,500 and no registration component for registrating any vehicle. So that's kind of a good one, but probably not much better than what we had before. We're still going to be paying third party um, insurance on that stuff. Um, no, no hint in fun, funding any charging stations at the moment from um from the nt government um we did have an announcement from the wa government that was um more similar along the lines um re resolving to getting a tax and stuff over there um but at this stage uh, with the fed still flirting with votes uh, we probably won't see anything until july 1st okay so what's a strategy we could use right now to um, create, well, certainly our highway between South Australia and Northern Territory, but also using WA in their, in their remote locations. The first good strategy, which is probably a, a one to three year plan, is to use these types of charges, which is the one um, that's in the Northern Territory, that's in Alice Springs at the moment. It's a, it's a, it's a 40 kilowatt hour, char a 40 kilowatt charger, sorry, um, that's, um, uh, the fastest charger in, in, in Northern Territory at the moment, actually. Still, it's been holding its title for about almost a year now. Uh, well, maybe six months. Um, so what this can do, what, what we can do with this charger is not use it at 40 kilowatts. You can actually scale it down in software to, to go on the 22 kilowatt system. Um, and you can obviously get 20 kilowatt chargers as well, but nice to be able to maximize that 20, 22 kilowatt socket, as you see there right next to it. Um, the uh it gives um it gives us automated traffic data as well on, on actual data on who's using the uh the sites which unfortunately the the standard system at the moment is just hearsay it's guessing um and plug share does do a little bit of um thing if everyone's honest about it but i know i forget and i'm pretty sure 60 percent of the people forget to to put their data on plug share so i always say please put your data on plug share it's um it's great to use it um, so these, this case, this would give us automated, um, automated data um, that we can use for doing more proposals to the government, etc. later on. Um, the good thing about them is they are, they're still pretty heavy. They're about 100 kilos. Um, I've seen some for 50. Uh, I'm still doing a lot of research on, on, this, um, on this particular proposal to use these. Um, but it basically, it's only a one to two person install. Um, we can actually get away with using a Sparky because we're going to be using the existing 22 kilowatt plugs that are out there. And um, so it, it makes the, the installation solution almost, um, um, well, certainly a lot cheaper um, in, in some cases if I'm doing it free. Um, still leaves an issue of vandalism and misuse. Um, obviously you can see there in the photo, some bugger in a Tesla's unplugged the, the, the charger and using his own charger, so it's bypassing the system. Um, so we may, may need that's to, and that's, my, that's yeah. my Tesla, by the way, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we may need to have hidden cameras or something like that to sort of protect them. Um, and uh, once, uh, once the bigger infrastructure, so the whole point of this is, to, is a temporary, <laughs> temporary solution. Uh, once, the, once the bigger infrastructure is there, um, we can then relocate these guys because they, they, they they're just hanging on a wall. 
we could relocate these guys and actually use them, say, in, in remote communities um, or, or a different location that deserves um, their, their warrant and, and, and but didn't want to put a big cost in the infrastructure in that different location. And they can um, or even just be sold back to businesses or public that are that are needing faster charging. Um, and, and funnily enough, that's what's actually happened to this charger. I've sold it to a business in town. He's um, a private hire guy. And um, so since you saw it on that video there, it actually has come off the wall here and gone to his premises and he uses it for charging his private hire Tesla. So already doing that. Um, so the next solution, the better strategy, probably a one to 10 year plan is to look at solar, um, a solar solution, but with a twist. Um, here's a, a mock-up. Um, it looks pretty good. It's actually a, a, a CAD drawing, believe it or not, oh, right. over the top of the video. No, it looks really good. Um, I didn't do it. I won't take grant for it. Um, if you want to look at the little sign that's on the brown box, that's the guy that's uh, helping me out with this stuff. Um, uh, give him a plug. Uh, he's in he's in Queensland, by the way. So uh, the idea here is we're going, going to look at maybe a, a 50 to 75 kilowatt solution. Um, two charges, one on each end of this. Um, the generator that you see there in the white, that's actually optional. But the idea is to mass produce these things on skids. Um, they can be easily deployed then by, say, um, someone with a tilt tray. Uh, and, um, and as I mentioned, the genset's optional there. It's most likely to be deployed as, an, uh, as uh, near off-grid road houses. And the idea is to more um, grid feed their local grid with this system and I'll talk about that shortly but um, um, and that works two ways so the idea is the solar panels would charge up the big brown battery there the big brown battery might be a hundred kilowatts um, nominally um, uh, and then that would therefore fast charge a car when it comes along the solar panels would then trickle up the the, uh, the, um, the battery again sorry and um but what if the battery's full well we could actually then look at doing um feeding back to the local local grid of the uh the operator there or the the stakeholder being a roadhouse or even uh even um this this thing could be just as easily in the in the city as well as the country we could have these as temporary stalls in the city it could be feeding back into a, a grid operator in the city as well and they could um, lower their power bills or their diesel bills in our case. So um, so that would be obviously an agreement that would set up. Um, some of these agreements are called power purchase agreements. They're quite common now. A lot of the super companies are, are using these types of agreements to do solar installs without any upfront, upfront costs. So it's a common thing to do. Um, what is not common is the, the slide. The slide, I guess, is the idea here. So here's another angle. Um, this is one I um, didn't install in front of Ayers Rock, but it looks pretty cool. Um, so what the idea here is, we wouldn't be as open as this usually. Um, the wood cladding that I've kind of very roughly cut and paste there would be probably all around it. So it would be still getting really good ventilation, you know, giving it security. There would be cameras up on the on the eaves. Um, but, but the two charges there that you see um, well spread apart so you could have pull through type charging if you had a trailer um, but they would essence be just just the charges showing so the rest would be kind of locked in um, try and minimize any vandalism uh, of that sort um, the little green things there are actually um, swap batteries we, we want to talk about them in a, in a future talk but those swap batteries could be charging there as well being used actually as the main battery but they could be used for say if a motorbike pulled up he could swap out a battery and keep going pretty quickly um, but we'll talk more about that um, hopefully in another meeting uh, very soon um, Sally if we can tie that one down <laughs> um, so yeah what we want to do though is is make an Australia-wide standard for this you know we want to we want to make it so if like remote staff aren't available we could fly someone in from Sydney and could still work on this and know what they're working on but at the same time, we want to make them um, versatile in the fact that if new equipment comes along, we can just bolt it to these things. Um, and um, um, the, the, the minimal start for this would be really easy because they've already have their remote comms. This, would, this thing would be built in a factory and tested fully before getting deployed. Um, 
We'll have a look at it folded up in a sec. But yeah, as I mentioned, it would have clad all around, just exposing the, the, the charges, but the clad would still give us really good airflow. Um, we could also have a different type of module set up. Um, this one could be swappable truck batteries, for instance. I know it's very, not, not, not the one you'd think about having a swappable truck battery, but you, you get the idea. We would have different modules, you know, um, for different uses. But the more the point that these modules could be platooned, they could be bashed, put together side by side and actually use more. If you need more solar away, you would put more, more um, skids out with more solar array. If you needed less, um, but you needed more um, versatile usage um, because you had a pretty good mains connection, you would do that too. So the idea is to be versatile, but um, common amongst all, all needs. Uh, okay, stop that. Um, so, and all these modules are, are cyclone and earthquake. Um, oh, didn't quite so spell earthquake properly there. Um, uh, cyclone and earthquake proof uh, for the northern um, regions. So, yep, yeah, no, earthquake, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, here's actually a real one. Um, this is a photo taken in Queensland. You can actually see the structure there is, is pretty tough. So you see the thing, you can imagine it folds down. Um, so it's, they're fully factory tested modules um, and they're just as, just as home in an urban environment as they would be in the outback. Um, the tilt there, I'd like to see that a little bit different, um, maybe uh, a little bit flatter for the northern, obviously the northern areas and also so people couldn't climb up on it. But that's actually quite tall, that tilt. It's, uh, it's a, it looks smaller than you think there because there's a picture coming up shortly. Um, so basically the remote diagnostics on these things, they'd all have 4G, 3G and satellite if they're not, um, if that's not available. Um, we could dial in and have high level remote diagnostics just like we do now with the, um, the other things. How are we going for time guys? I've only got about four slides left. Four. Ten minutes left. Oh, look at that. Um, so, um, sorry to bore everyone, but we're almost there. So the idea too, these things would have remote diagnostics, um, from high level call centers would have local um, either Sparkies or text to be able to roll out if needed. Um, but the, the, the worst thing is if it was all done and dusted, we could um, load it back up onto a truck or, or what they call a tilt tray, which is what they pick up with cars all day long out in the bush. And, you know, one thing we've got around the place that's plentiful is tilt trays. Um, so you can see there that's in its stack position. Um, Looks like to me, if they were 500 watt panels, there's um, there's about uh, six, nine, nine kilowatts in each one. Um, we might need more than that, but as a trickle, you know, at the end of the day, that nine kilowatts, that's most of them bigger than most houses would do. Um, and the idea is, is, like I said, have a big battery there that would be trickle charged most of the time. Car comes along, um, probably only needs 30 to 40 kilowatt hours easily done by a 100 kilowatt hour battery on board, but we could have bigger ones. Um, so the modules can be deployed by, uh, as I mentioned, maybe by a one or two person crew. You know, they just slide off the back of the, the, the flatbed truck, wherever you want it, or sorry, slide off a, a, a tilt tray. Um, or, or as you can see there from a, um, a, a larger forklift could easily take them off and move them on. Um, as I said, we're gonna try to be using, just like I did in the first one with the small chargers, we're going to be trying to use those 22 kilowatt solutions that are already out there. So it's kind of a plug-in solution. Um, again, just to trickle charge the battery. If it's, there's no sunlight, we'd be using their local diesel. However, the alternative is we can actually trickle charge back to their diesel network and they can watch their fuel prices going down as well. So um, that hopefully that might get that, uh, that local operator like Spud that you saw on the video um you know he hasn't gone to solar yet because it's probably a price thing but once he says the fuel bill is going down and we're only charging maybe 15 cents a kilowatt hour or maybe 18 cents a kilowatt hour we're at the moment on diesel he's probably paying 80 cents a kilowatt hour or maybe even a dollar a kilowatt hour just because of the nature of diesel um they might turn around and go oh shit well i'm putting solar on now and he'll he'll take the plunge as well so it tries to give them a, a try before they buy as well um, the good thing about the de deploy uh, to, to deploy and, and relocate, it should be just a plug and play solution. These um, 22 kilowatt sockets, yeah, we, we still got to get that passed. But um, the idea is they would just plug in um, when the guy gets deployed. Hopefully, near existing sockets, we, we shouldn't need sparkies unless those sockets need to be installed in the first place. Then we'd use licensed electricians. So the idea is to give everyone a, everyone 
a can do, give them a job. Um, we don't need to have specialised teams out there. The specialised stuff's done back in the factory. Um, and, and these things are great for temporary work sites, you know, where we know there's probably going to be a major installation, say, in the city, and we can deploy one of these, start getting some traffic data from charging, and then uh, once the actual major construction's finished, relocate these off. Um, so there's lots and lots of uses for these, not just out in the bush. Um, we we want to make sure we can um, have, have, have a, a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, so, yep. Oh, I think that was the last one. Cool, this is the last slide. Um, so where are we at? Well, the best strategy, uh, we'd like to get some like-minded businesses together um, and using AVA as the, as the catalyst um, to create some really good open agreements and design. So like an open type um, design solution that we can all follow. Um, maybe, you know, we don't necessarily want to license them up or whatever, have it as an open license. And, uh, and then that way, we can have parallel businesses in different areas working on the same solution. Um, it, as I mentioned before, the solution can be temporary or permanent, um, can have a quick um, quick deployment to a designated highway or route, uh, allowing time and data for more permanent infrastructure structure to be constructed. So it's it's the idea is, yeah, let's get a quick route done, have all of these deployed, start getting some data from traffic, and then, then we actually get an idea before we put the permanent stuff in, which is what they've done in the Eastern States. They can actually say, oh, well, actually this site might need three or four charges. This site, pff, get away with a 50 kilowatt. You know, we can actually plan a really efficient rollout instead of just stabbing stuff at a, um, at a dartboard, basically. And it's, as I mentioned, it's useful for urban locations as well as the, uh, for the same reasons as before, as well as um, out in the country and can be swapped and recovered from major, for major maintenance just by a standard driver with a tilt tray. And obviously that's the, the common tow truck of choice when we look everywhere now. Um, and uh, can be deployed as a standalone. So, you know, we can deploy it without plugging it into anything. The, the, the electronics will be as such as that as soon as it comes off the truck and those um, solar panels are out, it can be used. We could bring it online um, remotely and um, it would be a way. Maybe if we need electrical stuff done later, the, the 22 kilowatts needs to be installed, a Sparky can come along at his own pace and do that um, and not have to have everyone at a work site at the same time, which is always a problem. Doesn't matter whether you're in the city or the country, trying to get skilled labour to, to as organised as um, herding cats of um, can take first year experience to that. Um, so, yep, so it can be called, and so the idea is, yeah, the 22 kilo three phase circuit would be hopefully done the biggest circuit. And um, hopefully uh, we can prove that that's actually gonna work well. Maybe if we have extra skids, we might need extra circuits. Um, and basically the more skids we can put next to each other makes it scalable and adaptable for other types of deployment, like the grab and go batteries and the, and the battery swapping and hopefully we'll have more on that the next time we talk. So, how do we go, guys? Anyone fall asleep? No, Eric nodded off up the back, but he's not. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's still asleep. Hey. So, uh, I will stop my screen share so you can all see me. Hello. Okay. Um, any questions? Can I, any, any, any positive feedback? Questions from the floor, but well, I'd like to make a comment first. Sure. I think these are all fabulous Australian, good old Australian innovative solutions. So yep. biofuels across Nullarbor. Yeah, yeah. And to have these portable, there's so much potential, even for like when there's natural disasters, you know, and the power's off and all those kind of things. To have that set up on skids like that would be fabulous. So um, I think that's a great concept. So do we have questions in the room first? And then for those who are online, we'll put your question in the chat box and we'll get to you in a while. So think first, uh, yeah. I've got a question. Um, obviously at times there's Sorry, you, have to you can or I'll repeat it. I can, I can hear you. Yeah. At times there would be um, in semi-isolated areas there would be huge demands at short periods like long weekends, people travelling. Um, that how do you plan for something as complicated? <laughs> Okay, so um, coming from a, a telecommunications background, um, personally, that's bloody hard. 
um, it's, it's called traffic. Um, just like there's traffic on roads, there's traffic on communication lines. And there is always limitations um, to trunks and to roads. And um, just like there is in the fuel industry as well, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed a few photos floating around of cars lining up for fuel because it's cheap. So it is really hard. Um, the idea of the skids though, again, um, we could, uh, over time, we're gonna get those patterns. Um, hence the data is, data collection is really key. We're gonna get those patterns of when there's um, fast times and slow times. And then we can actually start projecting that. So big long weekend coming up, there's uh, Easter, something like that coming up. We could uh, and should be at a point where we could probably deploy two or three skids within you know, that day of, of driving the skids out, deploying them, plugging them in, and they're there ready for the weekend. And then we could take it away and use them as reserve skids. Would that make sense? I reckon they could be fired out for large events as well, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The thing about, well, they're portable, but they're not too portable. <laughs> they're yeah, portable, they're but they can't thing. get pinched easily. <laughs> That's right, okay. Yeah. So other questions? Yep, we've got a question up here. Security, how about security? Okay, so yeah. The, not only the risk of vandalism, which you kind of tried to address yep. as you can, what if someone just turns up with a tilt tray and tries to take it off the feet? <laughs> so absolutely, yeah, it's it's great, and and that's actually probably my major concern coming from that world. Um, straight up, there'll be four cameras, one on each corner of the the solar array, looking basically inwards actually to see whether there's going to be stuff there. The 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 comms on the um, thing will allow that to be live if it's needed. If it gets a if it gets movement around the thing. Um, the, the call center would get an alert and, um, you know, they might, uh, wait a few minutes for an action to happen on the pumps. If that doesn't happen, um, you know, the, their, their alerts might come up live. The, all of these, um, systems, including the swap batteries will actually have uh, a form of GPS tracking. And the fact that the thing, the fact that the thing is always live and it's got a huge battery in it, <laughs> The fact that that's that's it, and if it gets moved and and the GPS notices that get it's that's getting moved, tilt type switches. I mean, we can talk about lots of security angles. Um, the fact that it gets moved, that would be an alert in the computer system as well. Look, lots of work to do. There's not a right answer here, but we're trying to angle it from several levels. One, make the electronics out of sight by using um, like I suggest wood paneling because it just looks ergonomic, and we could be saying that we're we're um, sinking carbon by putting wood up. Um, the second level is cameras. Uh, third level is having um, movement detectors and, and GPS locators. So if it does get put on the tilt tray, um, it's still broadcasting, you know, as long as there's 4G around. Yes, we know the bush gets a little bit short of 4G, but you know, every time it comes in range of 4G, it would, would broadcast its position. So yeah, we, we would want to have a pretty tight track on, on security. Um, most of these, remember, most of these are going to be located at uh, roadhouses where there's already pumps, where there's already cameras. Um, so the idea would be to to be on top of security straight away. And the good thing about security or this type of camera security, it's actually really, really affordable these days. You can get some pretty good gear for like 4K cameras for less than 200 bucks a camera now. Um, so they could even afford to be damaged and still get away with it, if you know what I mean. So is that... Any ideas what you want to add to that? Do, do, is there any anything you can think of? Put them all on Starlink. Put them all on Starlink. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, um, yeah, let me show you something about Starlink. I've got a beef to pick with him. Uh, <laughs> um, but the uh, the Starlink guys, yeah, they're, they're great, great on your end of the earth. Um, at the moment, we're still looking probably another year or two away with, um, with Northern Territory. Um, let me tell you why. Uh, just while you're looking for that, another reminder, if there's anyone that at home wants to put a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll read it out for you. Thank you. Yep. Um, so if I go to that one, if just looking at the Starlink map here. Um, look, this has actually just been updated um, recently. This is actually the Starlink website. Ah. Um, can you see that all right? Yes. Yep, yep, yep. So notice the Australia bit here. Um, yep, 
looking after these populated uh, areas really, really well. Um, mm. Unfortunately, the Northern Territory hasn't seen a whisper yet. Um, funnily enough, Starlink can do little spots like this. Um, this Richmond town, I think I think we might have someone in there that knows somebody. And uh, this, this mob up here in Townsville, how the heck can they get a spot in the middle of nowhere and then... Uh, anyway, <laughs> so yes, yeah, Starlink will be a great answer, and especially those sites that don't have 4G or 5G. Um, but a lot of the road houses have what they call micro um, cells in them now, which just cover about a three kilometre radius. They're all satellite based. They're already at the road houses. Um, so, you know, most of the time we're actually going to get away with 4G um, and, and perhaps some, some hardwire comms. Um, but yes, uh, certainly for the areas that are, they have nothing. Yes, yeah, Starlink is definitely an answer. Um, yeah, don't get me wrong, I'm pro Starlink, but I'd, I'd be more pro Starlink if it covered my area. <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions in the room? Yes, Adam? Uh, what's the maximum radius for each uh, individual house? Is that I have to repeat that. How do you mean radius? Um, well, they're going to base them at the road houses, so they'll be in the area yeah 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 this thing wouldn't be in the middle of the bush it, it, that'd be the worst thing to do <laughs> it, the idea is to have some sort of infrastructure near it and road houses are the optional choice um yeah. at, but it, like i said it could be just as at home in a city block or in a in a service station we could put it up in the corner of a service station plug it into their three phase and and have trickle charging i mean we're not we're not changing the formula too much. All we're changing here is the portability. Um, these stations already exist um, in Queensland and, and sorry in Victoria. They're similar stations. They've got large solar arrays in the fields next to them. Um, we're trying to just micro size them and make them super portable, but super stackable. So they would be near yeah some sort of like we would want to have them near roadhouses just for first in maintenance. You know someone can walk along and. Have you tried turning it off and on again? You know, that type of thing. Um, you know, the, again, we're, we're playing with fairly new technology. It's We're mixing technology. Um, we won't be able to remote control everything just yet, but the plan is to is to try and do so. I'd love to have a full-time person at every site too. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. see. That'd be great. <laughs> okay, so Hunter, we have a question in the chat box. Yeah. Which is about the rough cost to produce each one yes. of these units and how that would affect how much you're going to be charging per kilowatt charging to use it, how that translates. Yeah, it's going to affect it a lot. <laughs> um, so at this stage, and it's really, really back of the envelope, I'm waiting to get some more figures from, from Queensland. Um, I'd say we're budgeting about a quarter of a million a slide. Um, that's with a, a big battery, say, you know, $2 a watt for battery. There's 200,000 straight away. Um, there's um, the charges uh the the rtm 75 charges i think from from tritium uh and the unit because that's a dc stackable yeah they can be they can be um many thousands of dollars um so i i'm trying to budget about a quarter of a million a slide which is yeah something you don't want to lose and what do you think people <laughs> would pay for charging in the outback i know across the Nullarbor yep. you pay a dollar a kilowatt or thereabout uh, yeah, that's and, what power costs. Same as yeah. you know, power can cost more on Kangaroo Island here too, and other places. Yeah. What are you looking at out in the outback? Well, the good news is the more you guys come out and use it, the cheaper we'll get. <laughs> so here's my my open invitation to to come out and come for a holiday, um, even if they're there or not. Um, yeah, look, it's really hard to tell at this stage. Let's. Um, we know around a dollar a kilowatt would be uh, in parity with fuel roughly right depending um yeah we, we'd like to charge like to charge a little bit cheaper to get people on but in reality you're out there you need a service um let's not let's not beat around the bush let's talk about a dollar a, a kilowatt hour and then um then we'll have to see it from there but again if we had the cheaper charges like i showed you in the first stage and we're only using diesel remember these diesel these diesel generators that these guys have got, they're, they're costing them 80 cents a kilowatt hour, right? If you work it out just by burning diesel, we don't want them to burn diesel. We know the big picture, but they have no choice at the moment. So yeah, got you, they've got to make a profit too. Yeah. So 
kill kill me if I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I, look, I think it's fair enough. And because also in remote areas, your cost of maintenance is uh, much higher because there could yep. be a whole yeah. There's a whole heap of overheads that that we've got to got to figure in. And people yeah. recognise that they pay uh, more for fuel in remote locations already. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at this stage, it's really hard to answer that question with, with a with a, an honest and straight face. It's just really okay. hard. I mean, and in another year, what's the fuel prices going to be? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> the way they're another, going. We have another question. I'm sure this is going to be about range because this man drives an IME. Oh, no. Yep. All right, uh, come on, Mark. What is it? <laughs> Did you hear that, Hunter? No, sorry, please Okay, repeat. so a, a quarter of a million a unit and a dollar a kilowatt for your occasional tourist, what's your payback time? <laughs> well, well, as I said, there's an open invitation for all of you to come for a drive. Uh, yeah. We're talking really long term, right? Um, my discussions with, with the, the money partners that I've had a quick discussion with, they're all quite prepared to look at eight to ten years payback, which is awesome right um for me as a business guy i would like to see three years payback um but i'm but it's not going to happen because we know there's a bigger picture here how many years did it tell it did it take us to stuff up the earth with with burning you know fossils well it took a hundred years so what's the what's the time that we need to do it you know yep yeah, the good thing the good news is we're, we're planning for an eight-year payback if that comes better, great. If it doesn't, well, I think we're prepared to go longer as well. So, um, it, it, from the, you're right, there is a business decision for payback, but there's also a moral decision that we need to make as well. I think that's a good answer. All right. So, is there, is there any last question from anybody else? Or I think in that case, I'd like you to think, uh, join me in yeah. thanking Hunter. And um, also thanking Eric for making sure we continue to beam Hunter into the room. With this is definitely awesome, Eric. Good job, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly thank Hunter for that wrap up of all of what's happening around Australia and some innovative solutions that could be put in place in our remote areas. So we include them in yeah. addition to electric. Well, one more thing, as you just thought, made me think of the payback side of it. We could we could probably lease these things to bigger operators um, for for good money um, yeah. as a solution to them. We could be hire a charger business. You know what I mean? Yeah. We could be the new the new um, Kennards. Mm. <laughs> Kennards you know the EV mean? world. The EV yeah. instead of a Ute Muster, we Hello. have an EV Muster, and they've got to rent all these out. And yeah. I mean, how much more do you hire an EV for? or would you buy it you know you, you always pay more when you hire something so yeah it might be a, another opportunity there all right well thanks again hunter that's Jeez. been fabulous thank you very much <laughs> you're most welcome guys thanks for, oh, for, thank for putting you. up with Stay me and hearing me with us because we